Welcome back to the Jacob Hornberger Show. Nice to be back with you guys. Uh, I'm president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, if this is your first time visiting the show. And uh, tonight we're going to talk a little bit about Italy and Greece and the United States and a little bit about the drug war. There's been some developments there. Uh, but, you know, on the fiscal front, the financial front, you know, the, this, uh, this chaos in, in Europe is absolutely fascinating, somewhat amusing. I mean, you know, they, they keep striking deals with, you know, now with Italy. We, we've seen the, the big circus going on with Greece for the past several months. Well, you know, it's spread to Italy, which, you know, a lot of people were pointing out was lurking in the background anyway. Greece isn't the only country that is borrowed to the hilt. Um, you know, borrowed much more money than, than it could afford to pay back. Uh, you've got uh, Italy you, and lurking in the background is Spain. You've got Portugal. So the list continues to grow. And uh, it's pretty funny watching the, the situation develop because it's so obvious the gamemanship that's going on. Um, for example, Italy is sitting there, you know, thinking of the Italian officials, there's no way they can let us go under, you know, the, the European Union, uh, because, uh, you know, we're too big to fail type of argument. And so they're going to have to bail us out, and we've got our welfare state, and we're not going to let go of our welfare state, because, you know, the dole recipients in, in Italy are no different from the dole recipients in Greece, no different from the dole recipients here in the United States. They're not going to let go of their dole. And, and they're going to fiercely fight for their dole, and the Italian officials know that. And they're just like the U.S. government and the Greek government, the Italian government is scared to death of the dole recipients, doesn't, was, doesn't want to antagonize them. So they're sitting there saying, well, you know, we're, we can't cut the dole for, the, for our citizens, but the other European countries here in the Eurozone, they can't afford to let us go under. Because look at the catastrophe, the chaos, you know, of one of the, you know, Euro countries going down. And that might mean they may be evicted and may even threaten the whole Euro as a monetary system. Each country may have to go back to their, to their original currency. Imagine the chaos involved there. So, so you, you've got this, this game of, of, um, of chicken, really where the Italian officials are saying, we're too big to fail, we're not going to cut the dole, and they, and they go right up to the edge. Now, on the other side, the, the, um, the uh, European Central Bank and the other European countries, they say, well, you know, we, uh, we're not going to be able to fund their, their dole indefinitely. I mean, you know, taxpayers in Germany, they don't like having their money taken from them to order, in order to subsidize the dole in Italy or in Greece. I mean, you know, might as well just let the Italian government tax the German citizens directly and all the rest of the countries in the, in the Eurozone. You know, just tax them directly so they, they can underwrite the, the dole for Italian residents. And so they're over here saying, well, no, you guys either do something important to, to start reining in your expenses because that's the heart of the problem, obviously. They, they're they spending more than what they're bringing in in taxes, and so they're borrowing the rest. They've done it for decades, just like the U.S. government has, just like the Greek government has. And um, the Germans and the other countries are saying, you need to rein in spending and start reducing this debt before our taxpayers are going to be underwriting your dole. So they keep striking these deals, and now we've seen two presidents knocked out of these countries because of these, this financial chaos and crisis. And uh, they keep striking the deals, but then some little quirk comes up, and it undoes the deal, and the stock markets around the world crater. And then all of a sudden they get back, and they strike a deal again, and the stock markets rise. And it's really all kind of humorous because... You know, what's really happening is, is, is this very well could be the, the chickens finally coming home to roost on statism as, as a philosophy. You know, the social, socialism, uh, the, the statism that has long characterized Europe, that has characterized the United States since at least the 1930s when the Franklin uh, Roosevelt administration adopted, you know, the, the welfare state mentality. Um, of the Italians, the Greeks, the Spanish, the Britons, and so forth, British, and so forth. So this could be the swan song of statism, and it's pretty funny watching. I mean, you know, these are kind of exciting times that we're seeing. Now they just struck a deal, you know, a few days ago, um, where a, a new deal, where um, 
the Italian government's going to uh, make structural changes. I mean, this is a joke. I mean, th really what they're doing is tinkering. You see, because they're not, they're not really addressing the heart of the problem. That is the, the socialistic welfare state, the, the dole society, this, this statist system. Now, they're, what they're going to do and what they've promised to do is sell off some state assets, you know, whoop de doo uh, and they're going to use that money to, to pay the debt. Now, my hunch is they're going to use the money to, uh, you know, just increase government spending. I don't think you're going to see much <laughs> liquidation of debt there. I mean, they do what governments always do when they got extra money. They spend it on new projects. I mean, you know, it's no different in this country. Did you see where Obama this last week, uh, the news media was reporting that he saved $4 billion in waste. <laughs> I mean, you know, he, he canceled the purchase of mugs and other things, you know, for the White House. And then do you think that he used that $4 billion to pay down the national debt? Nope. He just went out and spent it on new projects. <laughs> well, that's no different in Italy and Greece. So when they sell off these state assets, I'd be real surprised if you see any liquidation in the debt. Now, they're also going to extend the retirement age. <laughs> I think it's like from 65 to 67 or something. You know, whoop de do, big deal. I mean, what they're saying is, is that every it's like Social Security. Everybody gets a free pension, you know, free dole. Uh, you reach the age of 67. Oh yeah, so it's extended a couple of years. Uh, what difference is that going to make in the long run when you're spending so much more than what you're bringing in in taxes? And, of course, the status say the same thing they do here. You know, tax the rich. Tax the rich. Well, we've got to just keep taxing the private sector, you know. Well, the problem is, is that the private sector has reached a point where if you tax it any more than it's already being taxed, uh, b the marginal businesses start going out of business. And that adds people to the public dole, the unemployed from those marginal businesses that have now gone out of business. And, and more people on the dole means less private sector to fund the welfare state and a larger public sector that is now thriving off this reducing welfare state because that's the only place that the federal government gets its money. It's the only place the dole recipients get their money from, from the, the, the wealth, the income that's being produced by the private sector. And so they're really stuck. Uh, now, you know, Italy's, um, the government there owes two and a half trillion dollars. Well, you know, that's what's bringing down the system there. Over here in the United States, guess how much the federal government owes? It's like 14 and a half trillion dollars. Now, one can argue, oh, well, the U.S. has much, you know, more wealth and income and so forth, which is true. You got a lot more people to tax here. But the principle's still the same, that, that Greece and Italy are showing us what libertarians have long argued, that there is a point at which a nation can get where its debt is so high that people start thinking, I'm not going to invest in these bonds anymore because I may be the one that gets caught holding the bag. I don't want to invest in bonds that are not going to pay off or where the government's going to pay me off in cheapened, debased, inflated dollars. And in fact, that's what American statists are, are saying to the Italians uh, and the Europeans is what they should do. Uh, that, that They're saying you should inflate the currency, debase the currency, do the same thing the Federal Reserve has done in this country for decades, and just pay the creditors off on those bonds with cheapened, debased dollars. Well, and they're saying this will bring prosperity, you know, the new day, a uh, new day in the welfare state. Well, this is foolish and it's destructive. Uh, it, all they're going to do in this process of trying to, it, to cheat creditors, and that's what they're doing. They're trying to cheat creditors by paying them cheap and debased dollars. Uh, all they do is inflate new bubbles and, and, and new balloons that burst down the line because you cannot bring solid, sound prosperity to a nation through the inflation of its money supply. I mean, if, if that were the case, Zimbabwe would be a really wealthy country today, right? I mean, they, they've been inflating their currency uh, to the hilt, and yet it's one of the most impoverished countries in the world. But if that were really so simple, I mean, North Korea would be rich, Cuba would be rich, you know, this is foolishness. And the Germans know it. This is why the probability is, is that they're not going to inflate too much. 
in in Europe. It it really depends on how much control the Germans have over the process. You know, all the other countries, you know, they don't have much problem with this status concept of just inflate the currency and and liquidate your debt with cheap and debased dollars. The Germans have a long history that goes back to uh, you know hyperinflation, where you know prices were you know going up a thousandfold every hour and so forth. I mean, totally impoverished the country, uh, moral debauchery. People had no respect for the law in general. I mean, you know, so the Germans are very cautious. In fact, one of the most amazing things is that the Germans sacrificed a, a, their sound currency, the Deutschmark. Uh, for this eurozone, I, and I, I think a lot of them are probably reconsidering that now. But this notion of inflation—I mean, we've seen it in this country. Why do you think the dollar is worth like five percent of its value from 1913, when the Federal Reserve was established? It's because they've. This is what they've done. As as the tax revenues don't keep up with the expenditures, they just start inflating the currency, uh, paying off debt with these cheap and debased dollars. And, and it, it's a tax. I mean, inflation is a tax. It's a secret tax. It's a surreptitious tax. It's a deceptive tax. People don't know the government's doing it. Uh, they, they think, oh, no, you know, the greedy banksters are raising their prices or the grocery store or the, the filling station people. They're just greedy and raising their prices in the department stores. They don't understand that it's really the prices are rising in response to a devalued currency. And that's where the Federal Reserve comes in. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if the Fed were secretly uh, funneling money to help these bailouts of Italy and Greece. I mean, we don't know because the Fed isn't audited and they've resisted auditing. And the Congress, uh, despite Ron Paul's repeated request to, to have the Fed audited, won't go along with it. So um, it, it wouldn't surprise me at all if the Fed's involved in this, t taking uh, you know the, the printing presses over here, printing the dollars and funneling them over to uh, to Italy and Greece. Um, I mean, this, this thing is all a result of statism, and you you can see the results over here in the, in the, in that company that John Corzine, um, as uh, you know, became president of MF Global. <laughs> well, what did Corzine do? He goes and invests in all these government bonds. Well, why not? You know, I mean, he's a he, he believes in statism. He's a Democrat. He thinks, oh, well, government bonds are a safe investment. Everybody knows that government bonds are a safe investment. He invests uh, uh, millions of dollars of his, his uh, company in there. And, of course, now the company's gone into bankruptcy. And uh, so this thing has, has worldwide uh, um, uh, implications here, but, and especially for the United States. But, you know, there's one saving grace about Corzine's company, and that is at least President Obama didn't use U.S. taxpayer money to bail out that company. It went into bankruptcy. That's the way it should be. They made the wrong investments, the wrong call. I don't care how big they are. They go under. And that's what they should have done with those raw Wall Street fat cat firms that made wrong investments, too. They should have let them go under. New firms come into existence to take their place. You make a mistake in the marketplace, and you pay the price. But, of course, that's what crony capitalism is all about. It's, it, it's not true capitalism. It's not true free market. It's this, this notion that, that my buddies are in Wall Street, and I'm in Washington. And, and of course, you got a lot of the Wall Street people in Washington uh, running the agencies and so forth. And uh, so they bail out their, their, their fat cat friends with U.S. taxpayer money. Well, at least they didn't do that with Corzine's company. No doubt because there was so much taxpayer outrage over the, the bailout of the fat cat cronies uh, previously. And, you know, election year is coming along. So Obama didn't want to bail out Corzine even though he is a Democrat. So this thing is an absolute mess. But what we've got to keep in mind is all of this is the failure of statism. And this is what we've got to continue doing as libertarians is is confront people with that what has failed here and what will continue to fail is statism, the socialism, the interventionism, um, Italy's system of of cartels and monopolies and privileged uh, syndicates and so forth, where they lock the uh, labor market down, won't let open and free competitions, economic regulations out the gazoo. I mean, this is all a well-entrenched status system. 
and there is no indication that they are challenging the structure of this thing, the existence of the thing. And neither are American statists. I mean, you can look at any statist op-ed, editorial, and all they're doing is coming up with ways to try to reform or save the system, including inflating and debasing the currency, which, as I've said, is absolutely a foolish and destructive thing to do. What we have to do is continue challenging here in the United States that all the socialist program, beginning with Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and, of course, the warfare state, which is the other half of this thing. Uh, I mean, you've got the, the warfare people saying, you know, the whole military industrial complex, you know, going op ape over the possibility that, you know, some of their dole might be cut. And um, you got the welfare recipients saying the same thing, and they're both attacking each other. The warfare uh, recipients are saying, hey, well, no, you need to reduce money from the welfare recipients. And the welfare recipients are saying, don't cut my dole, you know, cut the military dole. Well, <laughs> you know, they're both at the crux of the problem. The massive military empire, occupations of two foreign countries, a thousand bases in more than 130 countries, overseas secret prisons, uh, troops in Germany, Korea, Vietnam, uh, not, uh, sorry, no more in Vietnam. That was a little Freudian slip. Uh, Asia, Africa, Latin America, absolutely ridiculous. Uh, it's time to challenge that paradigm of the national security state Cold War's over. Been over for 20 years. Time to uh, bring the troops home, discharge them. Time to close domestic bases. We don't need them. And then time to talk about not reducing the income tax, not talk about uh, you know flat tax, but abolishing the income tax in the IRS, along with all the welfare state programs, where we have a separation of charity in the state, where we have a separation of economy in the state. And while we're on the subject, a separation of education in the state. And if we were to do that, now you're talking about real prosperity, genuine prosperity, where people are free to accumulate unlimited amounts of wealth, where commerce is free, free enterprise, free of government control and regulation, where you got free trade, open immigration, people trading and interacting with each other, no more sanctions and embargoes, people free to travel to Cuba, to Iran, without getting punished and fined and sent to jail by the U.S. government. People are free to keep their own money, everything they earn. No more running down to the post office on April 15th to get, you know, your... your uh, IRS form in, you know, in the mail, and, uh, you know, and, and you decide what to do with your own money. I mean, you decide whether to take care of your family, your parents that may need some help, or, you know, you use your own money uh, to handle your health care and your children's education and so forth. I mean, imagine if libertarianism had prevailed just 10 years ago. I mean, the Future of Freedom Foundation has been calling for this libertarian paradigm for 22 years but imagine just 10 years ago, think what you pay in income taxes over the last uh, 10 years. L let's say you pay an average of, you know, $20,000 a year. Uh, you'd have in the bank, you know, $200,000 right now uh, to decide what to do with in charity, investments, savings, helping your parents out, plus interest. See, and that's the paradigm of, of genuine freedom, of genuine uh, free market activity. That's the only solution to this financial crisis and chaos that's only going to get worse. Because remember, the debt ceiling was just recently extended. And, and that means that, that there's a concern. When, th when there's a debt ceiling, that's an implicit acknowledgement of a concern that they've reached the limit on, on s safe debt. And they're saying anything above that, uh-uh. But they keep raising it, and they raise it again. But do you see any indication that the statists are trying to slash spending in, in the run-up to the next debt ceiling? None. All they do is just keep spending more and more and more money. And now, look what they're doing. They're talking about a war with Iran. Where are they going to get the money for that? But you, you see the, the same hype, you know, that you saw during the 90s with Saddam Hussein. Oh, WMDs, WMDs, mushroom clouds over America. You know, I mean, they just pulled out their, their playbook for Iraq, changed the letters, uh, the, the last letter from Q to N, and it's all now hyping this crisis with Iran and, you know, provoking, you know, animosity. And, I mean, let's face it, 
they can they can get people hyped up about anybody. I mean, if they wanted to w- go to war against Bolivia, they could figure out a, you know all the hyping that, that goes into that. Remember, they did it with Panama with Antonio Noriega. Remember, where everybody was scared of Noriega, you know, and said, "Oh yes, we've got to get rid of him." They can do that just with the power of propaganda and the weakness of the minds of so many of the citizenry that just get absolutely terrified whenever the government tells them that somebody's going to come and get them, whether it's drug dealers or, or illegal aliens or terrorists or Muslims or whatever. And, you know, speaking about the drug war, you know, I don't know if y'all saw this, but yesterday, um, I think it was yesterday, the, one of the top officials in Mexico, um, drug war officials, guy's got he's about 45 years old uh crashed in a, in a helicopter now now they're they're saying that it was an accident that was foggy but we don't know that yet uh it wouldn't surprise me if it, at all if if the drug gangs brought that helicopter down uh and if they didn't darn sure they they would have loved to i mean that's what they've been doing over there they've been killing uh mexican government officials uh for for the last five years I mean, remember when when you you hear all the American drug war people saying, oh, we just need to crack down in the war on drugs. That's the problem. We need to crack down, you know. Well, they did crack down. I mean, they have cracked down for decades. I mean, you know, mandatory minimum sentences, asset forfeiture, uh, ruining people's lives with life sentences for a small quantity of marijuana, uh, racism in the drug war, you know, in Talia, Texas and elsewhere. I mean, they've cracked down big time, and the situation is no different. I mean, it's no different at all. And in Mexico, where they've really cracked down, they use the military, which, you know, the American states would love to use. You know, you hear them saying, oh, just got to send the military down to the border. Boy, that'll fix those drug dealers. Yeah, they've got 45,000 dead people. Think about that. 45,000 dead people in Mexico in the last five or six years when they've been cracking down with the military. And, you know, we won't even get into the civil liberties aspect of this because, as we all know, when the military is waging war, they're not going to give a hoot about civil liberties. And and so you even have Mexican uh, people over there, you know, as regular citizens saying, get out of our town, just get out of here. We'll deal with the drug lords themselves because the the military is doing what the military does. It's barging down people's doors, indiscriminate searches, no warrants, you know, this is war. They take the same position that the U.S. government is taking in the war on terrorism, that this is war. And if it's war, the military can do whatever it wants. And in fact, you now have got the, uh, uh, the, you may have seen this too, that the DEA is now sending uh, forces into Latin America that have been trained by the military. Now that's on top of the retired re- quote retired military personnel that the u.s government's been sending into mexico so you've got this confluence now of of the drug agents the dea and the u.s military and no doubt the cia um in with respect to the war on terrorism and the war on drugs isn't that convenient and so you've got you've got this this omnipotent government power coming together now you know if if they ever are forced to get out of Afghanistan they're they're being forced to get out of Iraq much to their chagrin but as these troops were to be brought home the, they all know that the threat of terrorism would just plummet i mean you don't see any terrorism against the the Soviet Union uh, that is from the from the uh, arising from its uh, its occupation of Afghanistan. Yeah, they've got terrorism because of Chechnya. But once they got out of Afghanistan, you don't see the 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 radicals, the extremists going after them with terrorist strikes. Everybody was happy once the Soviet Union went back home. And that's exactly what would happen here. And so, but the military still has the drug war. You know, boy, with the drug war, they can get everybody all hyped up and say, oh, yeah, we still need a national security state. We still need a military industrial complex because the drug war is here. And look at look at these people they're killing. It's well, it's all because of the drug war itself. That's what generates the violence. It's sort of comparable to the war on terrorism. What generates the anger and the hatred that manifests itself in terrorism are the occupations, the embargoes, the sanctions against Iraq that killed hundreds of thousands of Iraqi children, the stationing of troops over there, the unconditional support to the Israeli government, the support of brutal dictators like in Egypt and in Libya and um, elsewhere around the Middle East. 
Well, it's the same thing with the drug war. It's the government policy itself that creates the problem. And yet, you know, all they do is say, oh, no, we got to ramp this thing up. We got to really, you know, get things going. And it only gets worse. You know, I, I grew up in Laredo, Texas, as some of you know, right, which is right there on the border. I mean, I heard all these mantras. I, I, I knew the DEA agents. I was a young lawyer there for several years. And so I got to know some of the DEA agents. I got to know, of course, the sheriff's office and the police department. And so I was really intrigued that recently the, the, they A&E, the television network, started a new program called Border Town Laredo. Hey, well, that's my hometown. So I tuned in on, on a couple of the segments, and it's all about the drug war. And what they do is they track, it's like a reality TV show, they track the, the local police department's drug enforcement team as they start you know, following people around and they monitor them. And this all went on. In fact, my very first case in federal court was a drug case where the DEA was out there following this guy around and stuff. Same thing that they're doing today on Border Town Laredo. And, it, and it's a dangerous game. I mean, they, they, when they catch some of these guys, there's high-speed chases. They catch them with assault rifles. And, and so it's, somebody's going to get killed somewhere along the, on the, along the line here. And, and you look at these cops, and they're all dedicated, and boy, they're really going to you know, stamp out drugs and stuff. But it's ridiculous. This is like 40 years later, and the same thing is going on as it was 40 years ago. Nothing changes except the identity of the drug enforcement agents and the judges and the, the clerks and the other law enforcement personnel. Nothing's changed. I mean, if your war hasn't been won in 40 years, that's a pretty good sign that it ain't going to be won. In fact, arguably, it's worse than ever. Because look at this giant mobilization of government forces. If, if it was like on the verge of winning, would they need to upload a, a greater quantity of government agents? No, you know, they would say, oh, we only need a, new f a few agents to monitor the situation. I mean, it's worse than ever. And all this drug war has done is just ruin lives, kill lives, destroy lives, destroy property. Uh, it's corrupting. I mean, you've got the cops, you know, stopping people on the highway, stealing their money and saying, hey, this must be for drugs. If you don't like it, sue us. And, of course, the poor people can't sue. They can't afford the lawyers. This thing's a total, absolute fiasco, just like the war on terrorism is. So you got these two wars that are now coming together with a nation that's out of control with respect to spending and debt and now inflation. Uh, it's, it's out of control. Assassinations, torture, rendition, incarceration. It's totally out of control. And there's, there's really just one solution to all this. On the, on the drug war front, it's just legalize it. Legalize it. Now, the good news is that, you know, all kinds of people are now coming out and realizing that, you know, former presidents of Mexico, uh, people around the world, uh, officials, you got federal judges, the cops, there's a police organization called LEAP, uh, uh, which is about law enforcement in favor of ending the drug war. Um, you know, th there's only one solution to that thing and just end it like we ended prohibition. This is the prohibition of drugs as compared to the prohibition of alcohol, which is a drug, of course. But just legalize it and treat drug addiction the way we treat alcoholism. You know, it's just a health care problem, you know. And some people never want to get treated at all. Well, that's their business. As long as they don't go inflict violence on somebody while they're drunk or stoned or whatever, that's their business. That's what freedom's all about. And that's what statists don't understand. That's what distinguishes us libertarians. Because we believe in genuine freedom, the, the right to live your life any way you choose so long as your conduct is peaceful. No murder, no rape, no stealing, no fraud. But otherwise, you're free to do things irresponsibly, immorally, and ethically. It doesn't mean the rest of us support what you do or agree with what you do. We'll just defend your right to do it. And so what they've done is they've clamped down on that concept of freedom because statists don't believe that. Statists say the state has to force people to be responsible. It has to force them to be good. And so you've got all this corruption in the drug war. You've got corruption in the welfare state. And then, of course, you've got this problem over here where the government serves as the international policeman for the world or, and the dole provider, you know, because there's all that, that largesse foreign aid that gives to dictators and so forth. So there's only one solution to all this, and that's libertarianism. And, 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 and that's why we've got to just keep out there spreading these ideas 
because ideas matter. Ideas have consequences. More and more people are finally waking up to the, to the hazards and the immorality of the drug war, the hazards and immorality of the, of the foreign policy of imperialism and interventionism. And uh, that gives us hope that as we keep growing in popularity and excitement, that we will reach that critical mass that brings a free society to our land. That's the show for the night. Uh, I won't be with you over the, the next two weeks, but I'll be back with you uh, the week after Thanksgiving. You guys have a nice Thanksgiving, and thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you in about three weeks. Good night.